look at how to draw good scientific data tables and we're going to focus in this video specifically on raw data tables which simply means the measurements that you are recording directly from your experiment. That's different to process data where you've used some kind of maths, you've done some calculations to actually convert your raw data into more useful data for answering your research question. So what features do we need to consider in a good raw data table? Well, these are the things that I think are important. And let's take a look at a good example uh, to see where those apply. So first of all, uh, we probably want to start off with a bit of a title. And specifically, how should we start that? Well, the first thing to be aware of is we should always label uh, our titles, or label our graphs, our tables, and so on. In this case, the label is simply that numbered table, so table one. Why do we do that? Well, it means that we can refer to this table in our text or later in our lab report uh, and ensure that our reader knows exactly what we're talking about. Secondly, it's useful to identify whether your data is raw or processed data. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about a raw data table only. So you'll, end, you'll see that I've indicated just in brackets after the label that this is a raw data table. Then the actual title itself, and it's important here, you'll notice that I've got lots of detail in my title. I should really be able to give this to another student in my class, and they should, without even seeing the data, have a pretty good indication of what they are expecting to see in my table. So there I've specified things like what am I actually measuring, how much gas is being produced, what did I do to start this chemical reaction, uh, and you can see that's all included there. Don't worry if it looks a bit wordy, it's better to be uh, too focused than too vague. So let's now have a look at the actual table itself. Here we go, and first of all, uh, what might we notice? Well, we need to have column and row headings. Whether it's column headings or row headings will depend a bit on the layout of your table and the kind of data you've collected. But in my case, you can see that actually my data is in columns, moving down the page. So at the top of each of those columns, I've got a heading. In the first one, we're talking about the temperature of the one molar hydrochloric acid solution. And on the right hand side, you see I've got a kind of bigger overarching heading, which is the time taken for the production of 30 centimeters cubed of hydrogen gas. And then underneath, just to distinguish between the different trials, you can see some subheadings as well as standard deviation, which we'll talk about in a bit. So what else do we need in those headings? Well, we definitely need units. My temperature, you can see, is in units of degrees centigrade. So it's units here. And my right-hand side is in seconds. That's very, very important. And secondly, the other thing in my column headings is going to be including the uncertainty, specifically the absolute uncertainty of my measurement equipment. And that is the plus or minus part uh, that's in the brackets with the units. So for my temperature, maybe I was using a, a temperature probe or a thermometer with an absolute uncertainty of plus or minus 0 0.1 degrees centigrade. For my time taken, maybe I was using a stopwatch here, I've taken the uncertainty to be plus or minus one second. So that's the uncertainty. Then the data itself, and included in that is going to be the decimal places. You'll see I've got numbers in all of my boxes. It's nice to centralize them so that they're easy to see. And specifically referring to decimal places, I need to check the decimal places in the absolute uncertainty of my measurement equipment. In this case, it is one for the temperature. And then I need to make sure that all of the data in that column also has one decimal place. So if I look at the other side of my table where the uncertainty is plus or minus one second, that uncertainty actually has zero decimal places, so you'll notice that all of my times recorded have zero decimal places as well. Now there's one exception to this. In my standard deviation column, where I've used a soft, uh, spreadsheet software to calculate these values, I've actually given these one decimal place. And why have I done that? I've kind of broken the rule I just talked about. Well, because some of them are close to zero, and if I was writing it to zero decimal places, they would be zero. This helps just distinguish a little bit um, between the variation in each of the trials. So because that's technically been calculated from my data, I can make an exception there, but I'd probably want to explain that underneath the data table. 
And finally, one thing that students often don't include in their raw data tables, but I think is very useful, is the standard deviation we just talked about. And why do we actually include this in the raw data table? Well, standard deviation gives us a sense of the reliability of my repeat trials. Ideally, if I'm doing things accurately and my methodology is sound, my repeat trials should give very similar numbers and therefore have a nice low standard deviation. So this is helpful because in your conclusion, your evaluation, you can refer back to the standard deviation to comment on the reliability of those repeat trials. And I think that's probably it for raw data tables. Hopefully this video is of some help.